with that, um, let me tell you uh, a little bit of background and why do I think that causal inference is harder during pregnancy. Many decades ago, there was a medication that was really effective for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy um, that was promoted because of the safety, but we had no evidence or studies uh, to prove that there was a safety during pregnancy. And you know, I'm talking about um, thalidomide. In December 1956, we started to see the first cases and 20 to 50% of those uh, infants exposed early in pregnancy develop this very characteristic pattern of anomaly. And you will argue that with that strong association, you do not need a formal fancy epidemiologic study uh, to find the causal association. Um, as uh, Rosel Walensky said last week at the Cater lecture, uh, you do not need to count every drop to know that it's raining hard outside. However, the lack of an active surveillance system in place um, made us have to wait up to almost four years to identify the epidemic and stop it. And by then, uh, around 10,000 infants uh, had been born with the malformation, and 50% of them died, and around 5,000 had to learn how to live um, with the anomalies. This had consequences for drug regulation, and after thalidomide, FDA and other regulatory agencies um, had a more power to require more preclinical testing. And interestingly, thalidomide is still used these days because it's really effective for leprosy and multiple myeloma, but it is dispensed under what we call risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, or REMS, which uh, mean um, to have uh, a balance between the benefit of using the medication while uh, um, avoiding uh, the risk including some communications and some uh, measures to uh, improve uh, the, the, the safety of the, of the medication. And you are going to hear more about these programs because Sonia Rasmussen is going to cover one for another drug, um, isotretinoin. Since then, for many years, we classify the safety of medications during pregnancy using letters from A, there is a control studies in pregnancy, so we know evidence of risk all the way to X when we have enough evidence to know that any benefit doesn't outweigh uh, the risk. But most of the medications were category B, meaning that they were animal studies, so in no risk, but there was no human studies. And as we learned from thalidomide, um, lack of evidence is not the same as evidence uh, of safety. Um, so since uh, then, we learned that we actually need to have some more information. And the FDA has continued the use of um, the, the letter system and instead uh, at um, the narrative. And we will hear more about it from uh, Leila Sahim from the FDA in her uh, presentation. So what do we need to put in that narrative? What do we need to know for a given drug? From a causal inference perspective here, you probably want to know what is the uh, counterfactual outcome if you were under strategy one versus strategy B. Um, but from a regulatory perspective and public health perspective, the first thing we need to know is whether this is another thalidomide. So more what is going to be the impact for public health, which is a combination of how strong is the effect and how many people are exposed, like when we talk about COVID vaccines uh, last week. And from a clinical and patient perspective, they probably just, many of them want to know, can I use it or not? And that is actually a very hard question to answer. Um, so where can we obtain the evidence to inform those questions? Pre-approval, we have pharmacologic and toxicologic studies, but they tend to be poor predictors of teratogenicity in particular. We have um, animal studies, at least in two species, but they are often also poor predictors. And then we have the pre-approval randomized clinical trials, but as uh, Annie Dupton is going to tell us today, most of the times we are excluding pregnant women from those uh, trials. So we are left most often with the post-marketing approaches. We'll have some case reports that can offer some clues, but also some false alarms. Some experimental studies might just by chance include a handful of pregnancies, but mainly we obtain our information from observational epidemiologic studies that now are called real world um, evidence or, or data. And how do we generate this epidemiologic data? We can use primary data collected specifically for research. We have sometimes large cover studies like the Collaborative Perinatal Project or MOVA in Norway, where we include uh, 100,000 pregnancies that uh, even then might have very few exposed to a particular medication. 
So what we do is to specifically enroll and enrich what we call a pregnancy cohort exposed pregnancy registry that target enrollment of those particular uh, exposed. And then we have the case control surveillance systems like the ones at CDC or Eurocat that use the case control uh, study design. But more and more, we see the use of secondary sources of data that were collected for other intentions like the claims databases or electronic health records or the re regional registries in Canada or the national registers um, in, Scan in Scandinavian countries. Um, Alan Mitchell proposed 20 years ago that we had a plan and a strategy to avoid thalidomides, starting just with pharmacovigilance and case reports that we know cannot assess causality, but can identify dramatic risk. Follow them by uh, exposure pregnancy registries that can identify also dramatic effects for uncommon outcomes or more moderate risk for common outcomes. And then have the healthcare databases to evaluate um, a, a, a large or moderate effects for relatively common outcomes. And this is because it, uh, the evaluation of the safety is a question of time. We want to stop thalidomides as soon as possible so that the pregnancy registries can be our first line of defense and roll pregnancies as soon as they start being exposed, follow them up to the end of pregnancy, say 10 months, and then you evaluate the data. While for databases, we had to wait for the pregnancies to occur and then for investigators to have access to that data. That used to be three years, then two years, now it's almost real time. So that timing thing is also changing um, for the considerations of the use of, of these two resources. And um, over time, uh, both FDA and EMEA have uh, required mainly pregnancy registries, but more and more the use of databases has also increased. And sometimes uh, now actually two designs are increased. Um, you see there the, the graph from Andrea Marculis at all, how the proportion of databases there in blue has increased over time. So in, in any case, all of that is outside the randomized clinical trial territory. So when we find an association or a lack of association, um, we can only as assume that it is causal when we can rule out any other explanation, including random error, which is a question of numbers, and also systematic error or biases that, as you know, is a question of the quality of the data and the methods that we use. So let's talk a little bit um, about um, the numbers. Because pregnancy registries, that first line of defense, um, even when they often aim to include the first 100, 500, often have trouble enrolling enough exposed pregnancies. And Lee Cohen is going to tell us today how um, they do to try to enrich enrollment and retention in their registries. So uh, sometimes you have to go to the large databases that might have larger numbers, but sometimes even the larger databases do not have enough new users of a very relatively infrequent medication. So we have to pool data. Um, and you probably have heard about the distributed data network like Sentinel or multinational collaborations like the Impress collaboration. Like just this week, um, we were able to, to put together 3.5 million um, pregnancies from six countries and provide some initial um, data on the safety of the new GLPT1 uh, anti-diabetic and uh, anti-obesity medications. So because our numbers were large, we can say that this association appeared to be valid, right? I'm totally kidding to this audience. Of course not. The validity is a question of methods. And even when we are here outside the randomized trials, we know that causal inference from observational data can be conceptualized as an attempt to emulate a hypothetical pragmatic randomized trial that we call the target trial. The target trial that we will conduct if we have no restrictions of funding, ethical concerns, etc. And designing this target trial, we know um, can help us prevent some um, biases like mortal time bias or prevalent user uh, bias. And the, the thing with the target trial framework is just like really a checklist for us to make sure we do not forget anything in the recipe. We have a clear explicit causal question, inclusion criteria for our population, clear start date, and so forth. So Krista Kubrick is going to uh, cover an example where she actually duplicated a real randomized trial using um, observational data. So even if we had a randomized trial, why do I think the causal inference is harder during pregnancy? 
Well, first, we have an additional time scale, the station. And we know that we need to focus on the theologically relevant period. We learned that from Talidomide. And for teratogenicity, that means the six, seven week after conception. And you don't have to be a clinician to know that that lady is not um, six, seven weeks pregnant. We are talking about this period. When it's like, oops, um, I am pregnant. And that has implications for research and it has implications for public health because we cannot wait to the first prenatal visit to say, oh, you should not be taking this. Um, it's too late. And the theologically relevant period is also different for different outcomes. Then in pregnancy, we need to know who enrolls when. And you can say, okay, eligible subjects planning a pregnancy, but then many of them might not conceive. So what do you do with that? And we are talking about a randomized trial here. Then you say, okay, I enroll them at conception, but we said 50% of the pregnancies are unplanned. Um, so it is unrealistic to do that. If you enroll them at the first prenatal visit, as we have seen, like that's the 10th week of pregnancy often, and it might be too late. Then you have to decide, are you enrolling the mother, the pregnancy, or the fetus? And you might have more than one fetus. So in pregnancy, we assign the intervention to a mother or a person, and then we have a new user coming in and being exposed as well. And moreover, it's probably the only place in research where your exposure can affect the size of your cluster data, because we have some interventions like infertility treatments that affect the risk of multiples, as Jeremy notes. Um, then we start our follow-up and we have all sorts of natural selections happening. If you start a randomized trial before conception, you have to condition on conception to see what happens in pregnancy. If you start even uh, early in pregnancy, you still need to uh, uh, condition on survival or the fetus um, beyond uh, the pregnancy because either they have to survive until the outcome occurs or they have to survive with the outcome for you to see them at birth. Then you have to define your outcome. Um, we learned from thalidomide that we don't want to look at any malformation overall because sometimes the teratogenicity is very specific. But that means going from a risk of around three per hundred to a risk of at most one per thousand. And as you know, for sample size, that's asking for trouble. And so we spend our time discussing about splitting and lumping together the birth defects and the consequences for the study. We actually spend many like, hours discussing about what is the major malformation. So I will spare you that. We have other outcomes that are also difficult. Uh, studying pregnancy losses is hard. Studying the long-term potential neurodevelopmental outcomes or even transgenerational outcomes like uh, some uh, adenoma of, of uh, adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Uh, after the ES exposure. So how long do we follow? One year, 15 years, or 30 years before we can know whether medication is safe? And then that was for clinical trials. If we go into run, non-randomized uh, real-world evidence data, we of course have to focus, focus on confounding by indication and other factors, se potential selection bias, including uh, by the design, outcome misclassification if we don't have adjudication of the outcome, Exposure misclassification because prescription is not the same as, as feeling is not the same as use. Um, so in conclusion, generating clinical useful evidence for medications and vaccines in pregnancy is a question of methods having valid uh, uh, estimates. It's a question of numbers having precise estimates with boundaries of safety. And it's a question of time. We want to have rapid responses. And a question that I want you to keep in mind during the presentation is also, what do we want to know to inform the safety? What is the minimum amount of evidence? So during the rest of the day, we are going to discuss the quality of the ingredients and the recipe to get to a good valid evidence serving, including the materials, the data that we are going to use, the methods that we are going to use. And you don't need an oven, you need a computer, Hopefully that's not your computer. If so, you need an upgrade. 